Welcome to World Energy Television. I'm Richard Loomis, CEO of World Energy. And today we have the pleasure of visiting with Mark Land, the Vice President of Land and Business Development for Buccaneer Alaska. Mark, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. So you've just recently joined Buccaneer. That's correct. So where are you coming from? Well, my uh, previous employer was uh, Renaissance Alaska LLC. Uh, prior to that, I was with a couple other startup companies, and and really most of my career was with the uh, Atlantic Richfield company, Arco, uh, of, of which uh, five years of that was up in Anchorage, Alaska. So here in Alaska, you've got some history. Yes, I have. I've, I think combined, I've got over 15 years working in Alaska. Well, as the vice president of land and business development, what exactly do you do for Buccaneer? Well, I'm sort of got the responsibility of looking for uh, the, the land opportunities and acquiring leases in Alaska uh, and, and for Buccaneer really focused there in the Cook Inlet and, and also as well as working with partners and uh, landowners that, uh, that we have to deal with in the, in the Cook Inlet. So is Alaska a tough place to operate? Uh, not so much. It's a, it's a different environment. Uh, obviously it's an Arctic environment on the most part. Uh, but, you know, you drill wells very similar to the way you drill wells anywhere in the world. Uh, and uh, it's just, you know, you have to deal with logistical issues and in terms of getting your equipment in, depending on where your location is in the state. Uh, but all very doable, and obviously there's a, a, a many hundreds of millions or billions of barrels that have been produced in Alaska that, that, uh, that prove it can be done. And if I heard correctly, is Alaska the state seeking new developments? Oh, very much so. And uh, that's really what's driving that is, is twofold. One is the decline of oil from Prudhoe Bay and Kapark, which are the larger fields up on the north slope of Alaska. And, uh, you know, I uh, think the uh, TAPS pipeline, which is the transportation pipeline that brings the oil from the north slope to market, uh, was originally designed and had a capacity of about a little over two million barrels a day. Uh, now that's roughly about 700,000 barrels a day. Uh, so the, you know, obviously the state is very incentivized to, to see that uh, they maintain the, the, the oil that were put through the pipeline. In addition to that, and, and really unique to the Cook Inlet, is the, is the gas supply. And, and what's really occurred is back in the 60s when most of the fields were discovered, drilled and discovered based on, you know, old mag uh, surface uh, magnetic work and whatnot, and they, they drilled some of the obvious structures back then, uh, there was a lot of gas found. And it, at that point in time, there was a surplus of gas. I mean, it was considered stranded. And in other words, in, in the 60s, who wanted gas in the Cook Inlet? Uh, well, what happened was the companies that were up there at the time actually uh, built the market for the gas. Uh, you had uh, Unical that actually built a fertilizer plant that was located in the Cook Inlet to, to take gas. And you had uh, Conoco, or actually Phillips uh, at the time, and Marathon uh, build an LNG plant. And they've been exporting LNG since 1969 to Japan. Uh, and they supply that gas uh, to the LNG facility from uh, their fields there in the Kenai Peninsula as well as uh, uh, the uh, North Cook Inlet field. Uh, but what happened is those fields are now on decline. Uh, they're very prolific fields. Um, but uh, and so consequently what's happened is uh, the supply and demand curve, especially during the winter months, is starting to come together. And, and there, there's a clear uh, fear on the part of many in Alaska right now that within the next, you know, one to two winters, uh, if they have a particularly bad winter, they may go short gas. Well, I mean, so the state is doing anything in its power uh, really to incentivize new players and our existing players for that matter to come in and, uh, you know, uh, drill these opportunities, go out and drill for gas. It's really interesting, Mark. Down in the lower 48, there's the rumor that operating in Alaska is very, very difficult. But what you're describing is a state government that's very energy and oil and gas friendly. I find it very much that way. Uh, and like I say, particularly in the Cook Inlet, where, you know, the, 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 as I say, from the world has changed there dramatically over the years. I mean, you could, you could have made that statement clearly back in the, the 80s and the 90s, um, or to some extent, because you know it, you weren't incentivized to drill for gas. Uh, I mean, it, you had a surplus of gas. The state 
you know, why were they going to incentivize a, a new player to come in and drill for uh, a gas supply when they already had an abundant supply of it? And they were getting it cheaply. Uh, one of the best contracts you could get back in the, in the 90s if you had new gas was maybe a buck ten from the fertilizer plant. Well, that's changed dramatically because now the, the latest contract that was approved in, in the Cook Inlet um, has a floor of almost seven dollars in MCF and a, and a cap of ten dollars. Uh, so it's, you know, they, they really recognize that they need drilling to occur. So specifically, what are some of the programs that have been put in place? Well, the, probably the one that has the most impact, and, and clearly from our perspective, that um, is ACES. And, and ACES was actually a fundamental change in the way that the state of Alaska uh, taxes oil and gas production in the state. Uh, but what occurred was the, the production, well, as part of ACES, and ACES stands for Alaska Clear and Equitable Share, and this was actually a program that was uh, put into place and approved by the, the state legislature back in 2007 under the uh, uh, Sarah Palin administration. And, and the game plan was really to, to provide incentives for independents uh, to come in and, and drill uh, really smaller targets than, than what the, uh, the majors and, and the companies that were located up on the North Slope were really interested in doing. Uh, you know, on the most part, you had, uh, you know, ExxonMobil, you had uh, BP, and you had ConocoPhillips that uh, basically are the three largest operators up on the North Slope and largest owners on the North Slope. And, uh, you know, on the most part, you know, those companies are so large that, you know, going after a 50 million barrel accumulation is not a, even on their radar screen. Whereas, you know, it's very attractive from the standpoint of Buccaneer, Alaska. We can make a lot of money you know, on a 50 million barrel prospect. Uh, so uh, that's what the state's trying to do to incentivize this. Now under ACES, what's really attractive in the Cook Inlet is the, we get all the incentives under ACES, and I think uh, Jim Watt had referred to earlier up to 65% of cash back. Uh, you know, and you get that back within a year to two years after you've actually spent the money. You don't have to wait for production or wait until you're a tax-paying entity up there in order to recapture those dollars. Uh, but, uh, but you got all the incentives, but you didn't get the tax. So there are effective tax rate, uh, I'll say production tax rate, this is not related to federal taxes, um, is less than a percent. I will compare, and in fact, we've looked at other regimes around the world, including the U.S., Gulf of Mexico, and it's the most attractive physical regime of, of any, any country that, that we're aware of. You've been watching our interview with Mark Land, and we'll be right back with more.